Please stand as you are able, and our opening hymn, uh, correction from the order of worship, our opening hymn is 423. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And bless be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
the collect for the day on page two. Almighty and everlasting God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading. A reading from Deuteronomy. Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Neo, to the top of Pishkah, which is opposite of Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Nepatali, the land of Arapan and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, the Negev and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the Lord's command. He was buried in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was, one, was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigor was not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him, and the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequal for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land, and for all the almighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of powers that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for this morning, Psalm 190, verses 1 through 6 and 13 through 17. We will recite the psalm responsibly by half verse. Lord, you have been our refuge. From one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth, or the land and the earth were born. From age to age, you are God. You turn us back to the dust and say, Go back, O child of earth. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday, when it is past. And like a watch in the night. You sweep us away like a dream. We fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and flourishes. In the evening it is dried up and withered. Return, O Lord, how long will you tarry? Be gracious to your servants. Satisfy us by your loving kindness in the morning. So shall we rejoice and be glad all the days of our life. Make us glad by the measure of the days that you <coughs> afflicted us, by the measure of the days you afflicted us. And the years in which we suffered at Show your servants your works. And your splendor to their children. 
May the graciousness of the Lord our God be upon us. Prosper the word of our commandments. Prosper our name. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our heart. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because we have become very dear to us. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated.
This last week we had a clergy conference and I'll talk a little bit more about that in farther down. It's not really specifically germane, but it is a nice topic as we start into the sermon today. And one of the questions that came up was, what is the greatest gift that we have, either as individuals or as a church or as a community? What is the greatest gift that we have to give to somebody? And as I was preparing, I remembered a time in my life, and this was very um, important to me. I was making Christmas, par Christmas presents for my family back in the days with the little wood burning thing with the different tips. And, and you know, back in those days when it was the sixth grader, I think probably was in the sixth grade at the time. So, you know, none of those little cool things. And so I was making presents for my, my family, and I'm, I made my dad this thing called, I mean, it was a piece of one by six, probably about this long, and I, I have not lost my marbles. And then I took marbles and I pounded them in, and then I took glue and I glued the marbles onto the, to the blank of the one by six. And my mom got one too, and it was, and of course I made a mistake while I was doing that. I was trying to clean the tip of the burner and I burned on the front side of it instead of putting it on the back where I wanted to. And, it, and of course, hers said, I keep a clean room. And then, of course, I have this mess all over it. And it was really pretty bizarre. Although the important part of the story is not the gifts that I made, but the fact that those presents were displayed not just for a couple weeks, not just for a couple years. My parents displayed those gifts for decades after the fact. In fact, I think my dad still had it on his desk when he was in Appomattox in the 1990s. So that tells you how long those sat around. Those were the presents that they cherished, not because they were great, but because they were made with love and with humor and with a sense of caring and connection. And some questions that we, can, we should be considering and I guess I should pre-preface this. Part of the questions or part of the thing that came up at clergy conference was uh, presiding Bishop Catherine, Catherine Jeffert Shorey was there and one of the comments that Susan made, Bishop Susan made was, she asks really tough questions. When you come to her looking for an answer, she never gives you a simple answer. She always asks a tough question to knock you a little bit so that you can come up with the solution. So my question to us is, what is the greatest gift that we have? Or as we continue to search for our relevance, maybe a question that we need to ask ourselves is, how do we provide a spiritual haven as a church for our community? And what does it mean for us to be a spiritual place? And what difference does that make if we consider ourselves a spiritual place? What does it mean for us to be relevant in our community? And what difference does it make when we tell others that we, in fact, can change lives? Because that's the greatest, one of the greatest gifts that we have. And then finally, the question I'd like to delve into a little bit more is what is the greatest gift that we have as individuals, as a church community, and then the broader community that we live in? My experience of faith has led me to understand that the answer to the last question is probably most often, probably not what we imagine. The greatest gift that we have as a church and as individual followers of Christ is probably not the greatest gift that we imagine that we have. Maybe we need to read, 
reconsidered the distinction implied by the qualifier, the greatest, when applied to our gifts and to God. But the greatest question, as we have heard in scripture time and again, is one that transcends time and space when it comes to God's gifts. And in the gospel today, the Pharisees have picked up trying to split hairs with Jesus to find a way to trip him up or to discredit his ministry. They begin with a seemingly simple question. What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus, in his way, pushes their understanding of the greatest by shifting from a holy, God-focused life to the life that they live in community. And then Jesus, being a good leader, calls for reflection about the true power of the Messiah. And we need to remember the function of the Messiah was not what the Pharisees wanted the Messiah to be. And likewise, their mission was not what they imagined that the Messiah would be or who the Messiah was. The Messiah that was coming into their world was the one who would restore creation to relationship with God. The Messiah that Jesus was talking about was the one that would transcend human understanding and expectation. Jesus as the Messiah is everything that we have been assured, everything that we can imagine about God, and everything others of faith have imagined. But as the Pharisees end up finding out after Jesus' question, the Messiah that we, they were seeking for could not be bound by our descriptions or our imaginations or our understanding. The Messiah and the Messiah's agents cannot operate in a vacuum or in isolation from their present situation. Jesus is talking to Pharisees who are operating in an, um, an environment and hopefully that in, encouraged them to look at the way that they were living their lives according to the true message of loving God and loving neighbor as yourself. The Messiah and their agents' message is sure. The best things that we can do and the greatest gift that we have been given is the ability to love God and love our neighbor just like we love God. And we need to remember that the message of God is also this, that God cannot be the means to divide people. Rather, God is the means that tries to create relationships in spite of the human divisions that we create in the world around us. As we look forward from today, we can't forget this, but we need to remember the associated truth. The Messiah is the reason that we are, as individuals and as a church. The Messiah is the reason that we come here, the one who will create a new relationship with God. The motive of our life of faith must be love through relationship and cooperation not affection, not the beating of heart, but relationship and cooperation. The motive is not for personal gain, even though the life of faith that we live changes our own self and the way that we gain things. It's not simply to get more of something, but to be enriched by our relationship with God. As a church and as individuals, we need to remember that we are important to the Messiah and the Messiah's work. But our work does not accentuate us. Rather, our work needs to portray a real life, wrestling with life, and to build a community in places where the community is fractured. The work that we do for God in the world is for God's gain and not for our own. So returning to the question posed earlier, what is our greatest gift? I'd like for us to think about that in this way. The greatest gift that we have is our relationship with God. That is the greatest gift that we have. And without God, the work we do is simply toil 
And that's the important thing for us to remember. The greatest gift that we have been given is not money, is not a church, is not anything else. It's the relationship with God. And the next greatest gift that we have been received, have received is our position in our community. Think about what we have. We have abundance. We have six and two thirds acres. We have an endowment. We have a building which is paid for. We have no debt. We have a history of gathering together. We as a community have a DNA which includes the entirety of people of faith. We don't have just the perfect people, the ones who are all well put together. We have people who certainly make mistakes and yet try to do their best for God and for ourselves. Our ongoing mission as we continue to envision what we are being called to become is to find the leaders who can help us reset our, reset our short-sightedness, to find a new connection with God which is uniquely ours, and to share that connection with others to help all of us know God better. Jesus asked the question of those Pharisees because they knew the answer. And yet they realized in the end that they didn't. And Jesus' question about what we say about the Messiah is poignant even for us today. As we consider what we are going to look like in the next weeks, months, years, whatever that might be, and where God is calling us to grow in our ministry and in our mission, the Messiah for us is a reminder. That is, Jesus is the Messiah. We are created to move forward in life. The one, the individual who leads, is in reality less important than the work that we do. The one who leads us, as long as they lead us on God's path, is less important than the work that we do outside these walls. And that the work that we do must be based on love, not on an affection, but on relationships that have been built with others. And the motive for us is continued growth. We need to continue to grow in our understanding of God in ourselves and in others in that relationship that we have both with God, with ourselves, with our internal community and our external community. The work that we do helps us grow into the image and likeness of God's Son, Jesus. The mission that we have is to share the benefits that we have been and boarded, uh, afforded but the problem that we need to, re or the thing that we need to remember is that that sharing of our gifts is not without cost. But the cost is of less consequence than the reward that we will realize in our life's work. We are called to be ones who bear witness to God and to share the greatest gift that God has given us. And what is it that you see in your life and ministry as the greatest gift which God has given to you? And who has God placed into your life so that you can share with them and help them find their greatest gift, a relationship with God today and forever? Amen. Please stand as you are able, and turning to page 6, let us recite the Nicene Creed, our ancient confession of faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, 
eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, O one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of the sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people are found on page 6 in our order of worship and continue on to page 7. Pondering the two great commandments of the law, let us pray together saying, O Lord of love, hear our prayer. That the church throughout the world may love you with all its heart and soul and mind and may exemplify your love in all its life. O Lord of love, Hear our prayer. That our country, in all its foreign and domestic policies, may care for aliens and immigrants, the indigent, indigent and the oppressed, all victims of economic exploitation, and all poorer and smaller nations, especially in regions of conflict in the Middle East, Ukraine, and Russia. O oh Lord of love, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Slava Ukraine. That the leaders of the churches, with incited fidelity, may practice love and compassion for all in need, especially for those on our prayer lists, for all who live in misery, and for all outcasts of society. O Lord of love, hear our prayer. That like the Thessalonians, our community may live in the faith and joy of the Holy Spirit. O Lord of love, hear our prayer that the wealth of our land may enable us to live in just stewardship of the earth's goods, in care for our natural resources, and in compassion for the needy. O Lord of love, hear our prayer. For this parish family, in this period of transition and reflection, may we be strengthened for the journey ahead. May we be guided by the Holy Spirit with energy and reconciliation knowing that you provide all things necessary for our common life and work together. O oh Lord of love, hear our prayer. Please offer your own resolute intercessions. For the folks in Maine. O oh God, you care for the widow and the orphan and you hear the cry of the poor. Listen also to our cry. Change our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh with which to love you in truth and for your sake to show compassion on all your creatures. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done 
and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please stand as you are able. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Greet one another in the peace of Christ.
give thanks to you, O oh God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took a cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with St. John and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from you. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
proposed communion prayer is found on page 10 in your order of worship. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for some announcements. Our closing hymn is hymn number 680. Oh God, our heavenly Jesus, our hope for years to come, our shelter from Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.